for me, um, our speaker this morning is Levi Wagner. So Levi, if you could come up. Um, it so happens that Levi is my son. He's our dreaded middle child. Um, but that's still good. Um, yeah, the Lord has been working in Levi's life, I think his whole life. And he went through some difficult times a few years ago. And five years ago, if someone would have told me that Levi could be up in front of a church speaking, I would have probably laughed or, yeah, I, I would not have believed it. But here he is, and it's wonderful. And it's a true, true honor to, to see Levi just loving the Word of God, loving God the Father, and making him a priority in his life. And um, Levi has been studying at, I hope I get it right, um, the Canadian Christian College School of Theology. I think I missed something, but um, he's been he's been doing that for for the past year or so, year and a half. And uh, yeah, it's just a real blessing. Um, it's a real blessing as a dad to see a change in the heart of your child, and his life has been transformed. And uh, many of you know his story, and. Uh, it's it's wonderful, but this is Levi, and I'll turn the mic over to you. I got a mic. Thanks. <laughs> I'll keep this one. Let's just bow our heads in prayer before we start. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for bringing us together as a church. Thank you for your word. Thank you for everything you've given us. God, I pray that your word would speak to our hearts this morning and that we would learn a little bit more about you today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So how many of you would consider yourselves to be a morning person? Raise your hands. Some of you. Growing up on the farm, sometimes you got to get up early in the morning and do hard chores, sometimes not so hard chores, taking care of animals and that sort of thing. But the prophet Samuel had a very difficult task one morning. He actually had the task of rebuking King Saul. So if you could turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Samuel 15. 1 Samuel 15, starting in verse 12. Now the prophet Samuel was given the word of God to go and actually rebuke King Saul for disobedience to the mission that God sent Saul on. And we're going to read about that now. 1 Samuel 15, verse 12. Early in the morning, Samuel got up to confront Saul, but it was reported to Samuel, Saul went to Carmel, where he set up a monument for himself. Then he turned around and went down to Gilgal. When Samuel came to him, Saul said, May the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. Samuel replied, Then what is this sound of sheep, goats, and cattle that I hear? Saul answered, The troops brought them back from the Amalekites and spared the best sheep, goats, and cattle in order to offer a sacrifice to the Lord your God. But the rest we destroyed. Stop, exclaimed Samuel. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. Tell me, he replied. Samuel continued, Although you once considered yourself unimportant, haven't you become the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel and then sent you on a mission and said, Go and completely destroy the sinful Amalekites. Fight against them until you have annihilated them. So why didn't you obey the Lord? Why did you rush on the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? So King Saul was the very first king anointed to rule over Israel. He marks this transition period in 1 Samuel where they were, before in times past, they were ruled by judges, which were local leaders over different areas. Sometimes you had multiple judges ruling or judging at the same time. 
And then by the time Prophet Samuel came along, he he was the last of the judges. And he he acted almost as a king in a way where he was the judge over all of Israel and he helped lead the Israelites in battle and that sort of thing, but he was not to be the king. King Saul was anointed king over Israel. And then King Saul was anointed because the Israelites actually requested a king like every other nation around them. They rejected the kingship of God and requested a king like all the nations around them. So a few things we're going to learn from the text we read is that disobedience to God's word is sin. Sin cannot be so easily covered up and that God requires complete obedience. So as God's anointed king, Saul was instructed to fill, fulfill God's law and God's word and direction from Samuel. The Amalekites were ancient enemies as well as distant relatives of the Israelites. If you remember the history of Israel, uh, there was Jacob and Esau. Esau and Jacob were brothers. Amalek was the grandson of Esau. And back in Exodus 17, when the Israelites were coming out of Egypt, coming out of slavery, um, it was actually Amalek who attacked them and fought against them on their way out of Egypt. And God never forgot about that. In Deuteronomy 25, verse 17, the Word of God says this, Remember what the Amalekites did to you on the journey after you left Egypt. They met you along the way and attacked all your, all your stragglers from behind when you were tired and weary. They did not fear God. When the Lord your God gives you rest from all your enemies around you in the land the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance, blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. Do not forget. So Samuel is bringing this word to Saul. But what did Saul do instead of blotting out the memory of Amalek? Instead of glorifying God and carrying out his mission, he ends up building a monument for himself and keeping the king of the Amaleks, the king of the Amalekites, as a trophy. And this is disobedience to the mission he was sent on. And God does not overlook disobedience, even when kings obey. And he goes to rebuke Saul over this. And we can take comfort in these truths that when the people of God are attacked or maligned, that God doesn't forget. He takes vengeance when his people are attacked. In fact, in the New Testament, when Saul, different Saul, the Saul who became the Apostle Paul, when he was persecuting the church, and Jesus blinded him on the road. Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So Jesus recognizes himself and aligns himself with his people. And so because God is truly just, he does not overlook any sin. Nothing gets by his gaze. But God is also merciful and gracious. He gives people time to repent and receive his grace. For if God was not merciful, none of us would be here today. There's a couple verses I looked up on rebukes out of the Proverbs, and the, here's three of them. The one who listens to life-giving rebukes will be at home among the wise. A rebuke cuts a perceptive per person more than a hundred lashes into a fool. Better an open reprimand than concealed love. Samuel loved Saul, so he goes to rebuke Saul of his disobedience and of his sin. So if we turn back to the Bible, starting in verse 19, we're going to see how Saul responds to the rebuke. Verse 19, so why didn't you obey the Lord? Why did you rush on the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? 
But I did obey the Lord, Saul answered. I went on the mission the Lord gave me. I brought back King Agog of Amalek, and I completely destroyed the Amalekites. The troops took the sheep, goats, and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was set apart for destruction to sacrifice to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. So what does Saul do? He begins to rationalize his sin and to try and justify it. He begins by blaming others. Oh, it was the troops. They took the cattle and the sheep. It wasn't really my fault. This is something we all do with our sin. Part of the reason why is because our flesh, we like to sin. We can blame others or shift blame. I think the perfect example of this is in the garden when Adam was confronted with the sin of eating the apple, of eating the fruit. He blames his wife, Eve. And when Eve is confronted, then she blames the serpent. Oh, it wasn't really my fault. It was someone else's fault. That's one way we justify ourselves in our sin. We blame others. We can also rationalize. Oh, I'm not really that bad of a person. An adulterer might say, oh, I fell out of love with my spouse, and I fell in love with someone else. They try and justify it in that way. And then we can minimize our sin. It's not really that big of a deal. Another way we can justify our sin is using religion as a cover-up. People love to take the term, love your neighbor as yourself, and you stamp it on anything and say, this is what we must do. It's loving your neighbor. Loving your neighbor might be being tolerant of anyone and any sin everywhere. That's not really what loving your neighbor means. But Saul also attempted to cover up his sin through his religion, through worship, actually. He says that he set apart the best sheep and cattle to sacrifice to God. Now this was actually against the instructions that he was given. He was told to completely wipe out all the cattle and all the animals, and yet he didn't. Worship does not cover up our disobedience. Getting drunk on a Saturday night and coming here Sunday morning to sing and praise God does not cover up disobedience. Isaiah 1.13 says this, Stop bringing useless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons and Sabbaths and the calling of solemn assemblies. I cannot stand iniquity with a festival. And interestingly enough, during our worship set, Psalm 51 was read, and I'll just repeat it. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and open my mouth, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not want sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God. That is the response that Saul should have had. He should have accepted, yes, I was wrong, and repented of his sin. But instead, he put his, dug his heels in the ground and attempted to justify himself. Another thing we can learn um, is that Samuel's response to Saul's justification is actually some of the most important words ever recorded in the Bible, and I'll read them here, starting in verse 22. Then Samuel said, Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? Look, to obey is better than sacrifice. To pay attention is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and defiance is like wickedness and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. So we see God rejects those who reject his word. And rebellion is likened to divination, which is 
consulting with demons. One definition of divination is this. It's the art or practice that seeks to foresee or foretell future events or discover hidden knowledge, usually by the interpretation of omens or by the aid of supernatural powers. It's seeking guidance from other spiritual forces other than God. Some modern day examples, I looked up a list, could be tarot cards, numerology, trying to see significance in numbers, astrology, necromancy, which is communicating with the dead. And this one I found interesting, molasophy, which is interpreting the significance of body moles. You actually look at the moles on your body and try and get answers from that. Bibliomancy, which is just opening a random book and looking for passages. Ouija boards, and even the Enneagram personality test. Rebellion against God is like consulting demons through occult practices. We might say, oh, I would never use a Ouija board or anything like that, but disobedience is likened to the same thing. Ironically, Saul did actually speak to a medium before he died. But God requires complete obedience. 100% obedience. Samuel might have been 90% obedient. He completely destroyed the majority of the Amalekites except one guy. He took care of most of the animals except the best. This was not complete obedience. Matthew 5.19, this is Jesus speaking about the law, and he says this, Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And similarly, James says this in chapter 2, For whoever keeps the entire law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it all. God requires complete obedience to his word because he is holy and just and good. A good God, a good, just God, does not overlook small sins here and there. He requires complete obedience from us. And I'll ask you this, have you been complete in obedience to God's word? Are you fully following his every and righteous command? Romans 3 says this, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. All have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good, not even one. So we find ourselves with a problem. None of us have been 100% completely obedient. We have fallen short of God's standard to His law, to His perfection, to His holiness. This is what a lot of false religions try and do. They try and teach you, yeah, if you're just a good enough person, your good deeds might outweigh your bad deeds, and then you'll go to heaven. But this is not what God requires. God com requires 100% complete obedience. So what do we do? We find ourselves with a big problem. We find ourselves with the same problem Saul had. After he died, 1 Chronicles 10 says this about Saul. Saul died for his unfaithfulness to the Lord because he did not keep the Lord's word. He even consulted a medium for guidance, but he did not inquire of the Lord. So the Lord put him to death and turned the kingdom over to David, son of Jesse. Romans also says the wages of sin is death. And this is where we find ourselves on the same trajectory as Saul that because we have fallen short of God's standard, we are heading towards the grave and eternal death. But God has made a way out. Acts 17 says this, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has set a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. God knows that we, none of us have been 100% obedient, so he provided his son, his one and only son, to die on the cross 
so that our disobedience and our sins can be forgiven if we believe and put our faith in him. And this is one of the glorious truths about God's gospel, is that when we put our faith in him, not only are our sins are forgiven, but we receive the obedience of Christ. Christ was the only man who was ever 100% obedient to God's law. And when we put our faith in him, his obedience becomes our obedience. When God looks at you after you have faith in God, he sees 100% complete obedience through Christ. So, believe in Jesus. Put your faith in him. And his obedience will become yours. And this is one of the things I always remind myself is that we do not deserve any goodness or anything from God. We deserve punishment. We deserve wrath for our disobedience. And yet God is merciful and gracious to give us righteousness, to give us faith, and to give us salvation in his name. And as I close, I'll call the worship team up for the last song. And we can remember that disobedience to God and His Word is sin. God requires complete obedience to His Word. 90% will not do. Only 100% is acceptable. And when you recognize that you have not been 100% obedient, turn to God and repent of your sin and trust His obedience. I'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for Jesus. God, I thank you for his death and his resurrection so that whoever believes in him will have eternal life, that we can have right relationship with you. Amen. And as the worship team comes up, I just want to read one of the lines of in Christ alone. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross as D Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I live.